I followed all of the advice using CO2 in my planted tank, but guess what happened? Instead of a beautiful planted tank, I got an algae farm. What's the deal here? Well, here's the surprising part. It's not just about using CO2, it's how you use it. This is footage of my diffusers. There's something wrong with one of them. Can you figure out what it is? If you can't, I'll point it out right about now. The bubbles from this diffuser are on the larger side, and that's not a good thing. Larger bubbles will rise to the surface way faster than smaller ones. CO2 bubbles will also start to dissolve virtually immediately once they hit the water. So the longer it takes to reach the surface, the easier it is for the CO2 bubbles to dissolve in the water. Getting more scientific, this describes fixed laws of diffusion, which basically tells us that the more surface area a bubble has in contact with the water, the faster the gas dissolves. Think of it like this. Smaller pieces of ice will melt a lot faster compared to a larger piece in the same environment. This is the main reason as to why we strictly do not use air stones for CO2. The bubbles they produce are way too large and you will be wasting a lot of CO2. Despite these diffusers producing small bubbles, they do not have a 100% dissolve rate. The only way we can get that is with CO2 reactors. But here's the plot twist. What if I told you that these small bubbles, or misting, is better for plants compared to a 100% dissolve rate? This Bar Report article goes over how misted CO2 bubbles result in faster and better growth compared to 30 ppm of dissolved CO2. I even tested this myself with an inline CO2 diffuser, and sure enough, my plants were bubbling as if they were on CO2 steroids. But why though? Well, no one knows, but a theory is more on the direct contact with the CO2 mist. Furthermore, the only issue with the mist is that it's not the most aesthetically pleasing. Also, variables such as tank circulation also play a role, which leads us to our next mistake, inadequate flow. Prioritizing flow is the key aspect for CO2 injection. You want CO2 to spread evenly throughout the tank. Having areas with low CO2 is an invitation for algae. It's like how we want adequate blood flow to our legs, unless you like the feeling of your legs falling asleep or don't have any legs. Anyway, the positioning of your outflow and diffuser is important. Both should be on the opposite side of one another. This creates circulation that carries bubbles all the way around the tank. Although, if you do see bubbles floating vertically from the diffuser, you either don't have enough flow, the bubbles are too large, you have a low quality diffuser, or it simply just needs cleaning. If you're using inline atomizers or reactors, flow strength is really the only thing you need to worry about. These examples all used lily pipes with canister filters. But what about hang-on back filters? Hang-on back filters are a little tricky with diffusers. The main reason is the design variety of the outflow. Some are straight down, while others can be a bit more horizontal. The outflow should be more horizontal in order to reach the other side of the tank. Now, you might think it would be more beneficial to have the diffuser right underneath the filter, but that's not always the case. Circulation may be localized right underneath the filter instead of evenly throughout the tank. This creates CO2 that is more concentrated on one side of the tank than the other. The only way around this is increasing outflow strength using custom-made outflows or an additional power head. You could also try adding a diffuser directly into the filter, but you still need to have good flow to get it across the tank. As for sponge filters, you're out of luck. Have you ever heard of people saying to aim for X amount of bubbles per second or BPS for short? Let me tell you this right now. BPS is a load of Bull. It is not a metric that should be used to measure CO2. Their bubble sizes will vary between each bubble counter. Its only purpose is a visual representation that CO2 is being released from its source. That's it. A better way to measure CO2 is with drop checkers. The only issue is that it can take up to an hour for color to change. But that is one of the reasons as to why we turn on CO2 a few hours before the lights even turn on. As well as obviously having optimal CO2 levels from the very start. Now there is still one more mistake that people tend to make. And that is strong surface agitation as it causes CO2 to gas off at a higher rate. This can be due to strong filter outflows or air pumps. Air pumps alongside CO2 injection is counterintuitive. The only reason to use one is when CO2 is shut off at night as plants intake oxygen and release CO2. That being said, you don't need to run oxygen at all if you have a clean surface. Having a clean surface is very beneficial, and if you want to know why, you can find out more in this video right here.